the purity fetish prevents a, an accurate understanding of the world. It, it prevents you from obtaining truth, but also from building a revolutionary movement. And that's one form of it, right? If we can show working people in the U.S., here are the successes of, of the Soviet Union, of China, of Cuba, even while under the boot of imperialist hybrid warfare, that's an extremely powerful argument for, for socialism, especially today with China. <laughs> a big chunk of the left, and unfortunately here is not just the social democrats, it's, it's also some communists, uh, see a good portion of the working class, specifically that part of the working class that um, that voted for Trump, they see them as, uh, in the words of comrade Hillary Clinton, as a basket of deplorables. And that's absurd uh, because it means that you can't organize them. If we don't do that, uh, one, they're only going to go with the fascists who are you know, always a, a threat uh, when objective revolutionary conditions uh, arise. Uh, but two, we end up just being the people that preach to the choir. <laughs> You know, we have to talk to people who don't agree with us. If we don't talk to people that don't agree with us or if we shun them out and say that they're unorganizable, we're only going to talk to the same five people in our in our in our circles. And that's not how you build a mass uh, movement for socialism. So. Welcome to another episode of India and Global Left. Today we have with us Carlos El Garrido. Carlos is a Cuban American PhD student and instructor in philosophy at Southern Illinois University. His research focuses include Marxism, Hegel, early 19th century American socialism, and socialism with Chinese characteristics. He is an editor in Midwestern Marx Institute for Marxist Theory and Political Analysis and in the Journal of American Socialist Studies. His popular writings have appeared in dozens of so socialist magazines in various languages. As a political analyst with a focus on Latin America, especially Cuba, he has appeared in dozens of radio and video interviews around the world. He is the author of The Purity Fetish and the Crisis of Western Marxism, our subject of discussion today and also edited and introduced Marxism and the Dialectical Materialist Worldview, an anthology of classical Marxist texts on dialectical materialism. Carlos, welcome to Indian Global Left. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. All right. So um, before we get into your book, if you can just give us a short background of yourself and in particularly what made you interested in Marxism. Um. Yeah, those uh, I guess those two things overlap because the way that I saw the book um, and specifically the concept of the purity fetish was as a way of really concretizing my understanding of sort of the trajectory of uh, my political involvement uh, in various parts of the left. But I got to say, I, I, I think I, I, I started getting involved in politics or I started getting the wheels moving um, with a, a very personal event as a I think it's the case for most people. You have an event that sort of shatters the everydayness of, of your life. And it makes you, it forces you to reflect on some things. And that event for me was when my mother had my younger sister and she developed internal problems, uh, fibromes, I believe is the medical term. Um, and she was told that uh, if she didn't operate those, um, she could she could die. Um, and you know, the, the question uh, rose, you know, do do we operate this and guarantee that, you know, nothing bad happens or do we risk it? Uh, but in risking it, um, it, it but in operating, uh, that would mean putting the family in, in a great level of debt uh, because it was we don't have insurance. And as we know, we live in a country where 60,000 people die a year because they lack medical insurance or I live in a country that. Uh, so, um you know, she was faced with this question, and uh, this was very worrisome for, for me as a young kid. I was maybe 10 or 11, and my whole life I had heard the people around me, as someone who was Cuban but uh, grew up, uh, was born in Cuba, grew up in Miami. I heard the Cuban uh, community in South Florida, which is, is sometimes uh, referred to under the category of gusano, um, which is actually a category that comes from Jose Mati. And is uh, Nuestra America, our America. He he describes the the vendepatria as the people that sell their homeland to the empire as uh, gusanos de corbata. So uh, 
worms with a uh, bow tie. Um, but anyways, this this community that my whole life, all I ever heard of them uh, when it came to the subject of Cuba was that Cuba was a, a, a dictatorship and, uh, you know, authoritarianism and political prisoners and a bunch of other things and, and poverty and, and how communism didn't work. And so I heard all of this. But then uh, when my mom had this problem, all of her friends and, and all of the family members, they told her, just go to Cuba to get the operation. So I, I I couldn't make sense to that, right? I was already 10, 11 years old. And, you know, what was going through my head was, well, I thought this was the richest nation on the planet uh, with a plethora of resources. And uh, why can't my mom have an operation here? Why does she have to go to this country that everyone spent their whole life criticizing to get the operation? So uh, as I'm, my last year of high school, Bernie Sanders uh, starts his campaign and he begins to bring up questions that- uh, This had is not... 2016 campaign? Yeah. 20 the 2015 yeah it starts 2015, in 2015 yeah. right so yeah. um he he begins to bring up these questions that were just not really asked in in mainstream american politics um the question of you know the irrationality of having private incentive in in healthcare and in education and in various fields and it just it, it clicked right that uh, that problem that i encountered when i was a young man not a young man, is still a boy, 10, 11 years old. It, I was able to start to understand it with the Bernie campaign. So I get involved in organizing with the Bernie campaign in 2016. Uh, that uh, is around the time that I'm entering college. Uh, in college, I studied philosophy. And, uh, you know, I had the, the pleasure of working with a department where the person that, uh, that was my counselor in philosophy was like the head of the local DSA. Um, and all the other people I worked with in the political science department and sociology, they were all like very active in the local DSA. So those are the spaces that uh, that I started engaging in, in political practice. And, and uh, you know, you, as a philosophy undergrad, you start to read your remarks, you start to read um, your history of philosophy, your angles, your Lenin. And, uh, you know, I went from the sort of uh, Bernie social Democrat to a Marxist and as I continued working in these social democratic uh, or, or democratic socialist spaces, I began to have uh, similar uh, problems arise and similar questions arise um, as to some of the ways that uh, certain things were thought about or certain things were approached. And um, I felt that there was ways in which the practices that were being engaged in were alienating to the working class. And some of the things that I was engaging with in my reading of what Marxism should be emphasizing, I didn't see it emphasized in these sorts of uh, circles. Um, so that uh, prompted me on, on the conclusion of, of my undergraduate studies to start uh, what has now become the Midwestern Marx Institute, along with um, you know, my, my co-founder and, and best friend, uh, Edward Smith. And uh, that uh, project that first started as a blog of sorts uh, it ended up for some reason <laughs> it's just taking off uh, he would he started uh, making short tiktok videos which i thought was lunacy at the time but he was making one to two minute tiktok videos on politics and marxist theory and uh, we ended up gr growing the channel to close to half a million uh, um, followers within a year that fed into the website and we developed a, a big team of people and, and counselors and you know uh, professors and activists longtime activists who joined the institute and have given it shape and uh, it's really developed into a broad approach for political education in the u.s but in a way that engages of course uh, at the international level with other organizations and with other researchers from you know we have researchers from india from um, from South America, from various parts of the world. And uh, it's developed into this, this project that uh, now has not just the website, but a journal, publishing press, the YouTube stuff uh, that we do, social media, and uh, you know censorship campaigns that uh, have came after us. That I mentioned that original TikTok account, that was banned um, as soon as the, the control over TikTok was passed over to the American company. And uh, it was around the time of the, the beginning of the special military operations in Ukraine. We had the account banned. 
we made six new ones in the course since then and the six new ones have been banned as well so um but that's the sort of uh context of of uh my political work i do a lot of work on the ground as well but uh, a good chunk of it is related to political education theoretical education uh within the the midwestern marx institute yeah, th this is a very good background because your book, um, at least as I read it, I saw it having three essential parts, like three components. Uh, the first is the philosophical foundation that you begin your book with. Mm -hmm. And then the question of imperialism, which sort of brings politics with the philosophy and theory, bringing to the fore what our answer should be, our positions, location should be in the cold war that is going on in the hot or the hot war that is going on what should be our focus regarding the global south and so it, it very directly brings politics to that uh, and should i support politics of imperialism and the third part i should say is where it goes back to the imperial core and then it tries to answer that why has some sort of revolutionary or very rapid progressive developments haven't taken place in the U.S. imperial core. And you sort of provide an explanation and an answer towards moving away from fatalism. So um, let's start with the part two. And I like this is, uh, you know, this is sort of. Uh, disturbing the order of your book uh, just for the sake of accessibility, perhaps. So I'd like to start with the question of imperialism, discuss U.S., and then wrap it up with the philosophical understanding of what you tried to do. So um, tell us why you think that an anti-imperialistic um, politics should be at the core of a Marxist socialist understanding or approach to our politics. Why it is why is it so important today? Oh, you know, how long how long do you have? You know, there's so many reasons. Uh, but I, I think this is so primary. And this was uh, again, I mentioned, I, I think I did uh, earlier three, there was three central reasons uh, why we ended up starting Midwestern Marx. And one of them was the question of anti-imperialism. And the question of how it is that the Western left, or, or specifically the American left, views socialist states, uh, or even you know anti-imperialist states that exist outside of the sphere of influence of empire, and uh, you know an event that uh, very much uh, uh, put in, in in right in my face uh, the anti anti-imperialist character of the American left was the 2019 Socialism Conference, which I believe I cite in the in the in the book in the last chapter, where, uh, you know, countries like Cuba, Venezuela, and China were being described as authoritarian and, and dictatorships and in the negative sense, right? Not in the more scientific sense of like a dictatorship of the proletariat, but, you know, in the, you know, more quotidian sense of a, of a condemnation. And I really did not understand that. Um, I, I didn't understand that. I was puzzled by that uh, when, when I saw it occur. And uh, the week after that, uh, Ben Norton and Max Blumenthal had published an article showing how some of those speakers were actually funded by uh, by USAID, and uh, <laughs> which is, of course, has been one of the the arms of, of U.S. imperialism under the the mask of being a non so called non governmental organization. Um, so this is a problem. Sorry, for our viewers, this is the 2019 conference uh, by PSA, Jacobin, and Haymarket Books. You're yeah, talking. precisely. Right, right. Um, so, I mean, I mean, you know, an organization like DSA, there's been some changes within, like the International Committee has been a lot better in the last year um, at supporting socialist states, it's, at sending out brigades. Um, and I've heard that perhaps there's some tensions with the 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 old cats that uh, are, are much more in line with what went down in the 2019 and the newer folks uh but either way you know this if there's if there's a common thread in in american socialism and in western marxism in general it's the condemnation of socialist states uh this is a scene through and through you could trace it back perhaps to the second international but you know, you see it in, in various trends in the Frankfurt School and in the, 
in the school of Marxist humanism that arises in the West and uh, in, in various schools of, of Western Marxism that they all reject socialism. And, you know, I, I, I've, as a philosopher, I've had to engage with all of these traditions and what I have found and um, what uh, prompted me to, to em embark on this project of concretizing how it is that these flaws arise through the concept of the purity fetish was that I saw that in each case, uh, what ends up being the sort of heart of the rejection of socialism is the fact that it doesn't meet the pure standards of what a socialist project must be uh, in their heads to be considered socialist, to be supported. And uh, I have developed this uh, as, as a purity fetish, as it is an incessant obsession with meeting purity, uh, meeting the, the, the ideal standards of purity uh, for uh, as a precondition for supporting or collaborating with something. Um, and this is very clear in the stances that these people have taken with actually existing socialism. And in the US, this brings up a wide variety of paradoxes, uh, you know, one of which is the fact that a lot of these people who condemn socialist states, uh, ignoring the tremendous pressures that uh, these countries that have tried to build uh, or that have built socialism in the global South and East, the tremendous pressure of doing that as imperialized countries that have been under the boot of colonialism and imperialism for 400 years and have been looted and kept intentionally poor to enrich imperialism, the pressures of, of those historically inherited problems and then the pressures of imperialist hybrid warfare contemporarily. Um, so it's a, it's a world that's still dominated by global capitalism and imperialism, and that makes uh, the sort of socialism that's constructed necessarily siege socialism, as Michael Parenti would call it. It's a socialism that's constantly having to fight off imperialism and collaborating uh, forces within uh, the country that achieved the revolution. So uh, to expect that, you know, uh, to expect these countries to meet the pure standards of abolishing the state, abolishing classes from each according to their ability to each according to, it's just absurd. It's it's unrealistic. Uh, but that has been the method of analysis that the Western Marxists have taken to, you know, whether it's the USSR, China, Vietnam, Cuba, the DPRK, you name it, you know, Venezuela, Nicaragua. Um, if it doesn't meet these pure standards, I'm going to reject it. And it's, it's it, when that is the operation through which judgment is passed, you're dealing with something else that's not Marxism. You're, you're fundamentally at the level of worldview, how the world is approached. You're not participating in analyzing the world and judging affairs from a Marxist worldview. Uh, you're judging affairs from the worldview that I've labeled the purity fetish, uh, which is grounded very much in, in uh, not just bourgeois philosophy, but in this long tradition of thought that stems out of the West. I see it, I, I argue that it is rooted in, uh, in, in ancient Greek philosophy, specifically in, in the debates that arose over the question of change. You know, how is, how is change going to be understood What's the relationship of the change that we see to, you know, ultimate truths? And you have two schools, uh, 500 years before Christ. You have the Iliadic school uh, with figures like Parmenides and Zeno, who argue that change is, is really an illusion. What you have is uh, an indivisible oneness and truth. Truth is tied to that which is unchanging and one. But the, the way that they think about the one or the totality is as undivided. It doesn't allow for internal plurality, internal divisibility, um, internal contradiction, right? Contradiction and movement, all of that is uh, is archetypical of the way of opinion, the way of falsity for them. And as opposed to that, you have the, the school of Heraclitus, which sees that everything is in constant change, that uh, that change is propelled by internal contradictions. And uh, that school is then taken up by Hegel and, and Marxism. But the other school, the school that looks at things very statically, uh, that is not able to tarry with objective contradictions, that school has basically permeated the history of Western thought. It gets uh, adjusted and, and it gets uh, readjusted in Plato's thought, it gets readjusted in Aristotle's thought. And uh, pretty much with Plato and Aristotle, you just have certain repetitions of their thought throughout Western philosophy. Famously, of course, uh, Alfred North Whitehead said that all of Western philosophy is a footnote to to Plato, um, with I would say with the exception perhaps of, of Hegel, who, you know, anyways, that, that takes us into a whole nother bag of bananas. But um, 
you know, the question of, of anti-imperialism is, is, is absolutely central because imperialism as a, you know, the tradition of Marxism that, that I adhere to, uh, I would argue it's the highest stage of capitalism that we have um, after capital has fully consolidated and monopolized and, um, and, and become global. Uh, and if that is the case, then the struggle that we have to wage uh, necessarily has to be anti-imperialist and internationalist. And we have to realize that the, the same interests which oppress and exploit American workers are the ones that bomb Iraq, that, you know, wage proxy wars against Russia, that, you know, demonize China and are setting up a new Cold War with China. It's the same class. It's the same class of, of monopoly capitalists. Um, so in, in order to be successful in our struggle here, we have to be allied with the struggles of the peoples of the world. And uh, we have to be, you know, as Che used to say, we have to be cheerful when a struggle in the farthest corner of the planet succeeds. And we have to uh, feel melancholic and, and down when, you know, in the farthest corner of the planet, the struggle fails. We have to be deeply internationalist. And, uh, you know, from, from another uh from another point of view, the importance of anti-imperialist struggle in the U.S. specifically, it's tied to debunking the great myth that McCarthyism and anti-communism has made people believe in the U.S., which is that socialism has always failed. It's such an, an incredibly upside down comment that, uh, you know, it has no grounding in reality, because if you, if you actually look at uh, the history of socialist countries, regardless of its, of its flaws, its imperfections and the difficulties caused by imperialist hybrid warfare, sanctions, and, and all sorts of attacks. It's been tremendously successful for their massive people. It's lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. It's, gave them, it's given them dignified lives, you know, free education, free healthcare, the, the, the basic securities that um, are necessary in order to live uh, free human lives. And it's done that through empowering the, that the people themselves are the ones that guarantee this for themselves. They're not like handouts or concessions from, from, an, from the capitalist class. So if, if we are to succeed in, in my country, at, at least what we have to do is debunk this myth. And that's intimately related to defending socialism, defending actually existing socialism, showing our people how it is that socialism has succeeded and debunking this, this, this myth that socialism has, has always failed. So, you know, anti-imperialism is fundamental and it's not something separated from the class struggle at home. It's intimately tied to the struggles that we're waging in the U.S. Mm -hmm. one, one of the things you say is that uh, this Western Marxists in denouncing the existing socialist systems or previously existing socialist systems eventually make it a, make a case that socialism is worse than capitalism mm -hmm. and regardless of the critique of capitalism eventually that becomes the lesser of the two two evils and people are eventually persuaded that regardless of how bad our situation is how unaffordable housing or healthcare or student education be maybe this is the best we can have and we can be at least we can, like at best, we can do some incremental change. So there is a sense of fatalism that emerges out of that. Yes, yes. Oh, absolutely. They become, you know, uh, Churchill, Thatcher, socialists or third, Churchill, Thatcher, uh, Marxists. Of course, uh, Churchill says that capitalism is the worst system, except for all the other ones. And then uh, uh, Thatcher says there is no alternative, right? That Those are the big slogans. And this is what the, the vast majority of Western Marxists, at least in practice, end up acting as if it's it's true because they end up um, condemning socialism to the point of considering it a far worse alternative um, to to the current capitalist order. And, uh, you know, that's that's uh, that ends up making these uh, these figures agents of what I call in the book a controlled counter hegemony. Um, or what, uh, you know, our colleague uh, Gabriel Rockwell has called the radical recuperators. There's a bunch of different terms that have been uh, used in, in, I think, the good part of the Marxist tradition to think about these figures. Uh, but in, in essence, you, you have a capitalism, especially as it enters its imperialist stage in the, in the late 
19th century, that is just, it's going into periodic crisis. Uh, it's bound every decade to, to, to crash and to leave masses of, of people disenchanted and in horrendous conditions. And naturally that leads to dissenting attitudes. That means that the defense of capitalism ideologically needs to take a completely different form. Like uh, direct apologetics of capitalism is no longer going to work. Um, the pro projects like PragerU, <laughs> which are laughably dumb, but the vast majority of people who are watching that from a working class background don't buy that. Like you watch their their Facebook stuff and the vast majority of the reactions are like laughing reactions or people commenting, making fun of them. And that's because direct apologetics is not going to work. You need what Lukács called indirect apologetics. Um, you need to present the defense of capitalism as a critique of capitalism. And uh, this is what these figures do, these radical recuperators, these agents of a controlled counter hegemony. They are uh, the left wing delegitimizers of socialist and anti-imperialist states that play the role of a sort of tambourine uh, that adds uh, to the melody of the mainstream media's war drums. Every time that there's an, a new imperialist war waged on, on whatever country uh, there is. And what these people do is that when these periods of, of movement begin, they recuperate. That's why they're radical recuperators. They recuperate that energy that could be siphoned into truly revolutionary areas that substantially oppose capitalist imperialism. They recuperate that into a fold that uh, is pro-imperialism and that doesn't substantially challenge the, ex the, the uh, existing order, all while seeming to be the most radical, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that is why it's a controlled counter-hegemony because it presents itself as if it's actually challenging the ruling ideas as if it's actually participating in a war of positions against the dominant hegemonic order. But in reality, it is the most indispensable form of, uh, uh, of solidifying bourgeois hegemony. Uh, because it, uh, it, when you have a left that uh, agrees that, okay, capitalism is bad, you have these commodities and, and this does weird things to be, yeah, but socialism has always been far worse. And socialism means gulags and it means genocide and it means poverty and it means this and it means that. You know, <laughs> that's the perfect opposition that the capitalist order uh, needs. And and it's they've become an indispensable component for bourgeois hegemony. And you see it in, in figures like Shishak and, you know, you name them. Whoever is publishing in the leading journals that call themselves Marxists coming out of peer-reviewed uh, the academy and 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 index and all the biggest places of the academy, those are the people participating in in that uh, sort of work, and it's done in, in a variety of other mediums as well. But um, you know, we we have to realize that th this is all intentional. Um, there's been conferences that have been held and organizations and the funding of journals and magazines and uh, the propping up of intellectuals and this compatible left as the you know the for the cia agent uh, thomas braden called it it's a compatible left it's compatible because it doesn't substantially oppose capitalism and you know i would uh, recommend uh, the the work of, of gabriel rockhill uh, that really digs deep into um the the institutions and 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 material grounds behind uh, what he calls this global theory industry you know these uh, what I call the agents that uh, think through the purity fetish and are, are the agents of a controlled counter hegemony. Um, it is absolutely propped up by imperialism. And you have the, the Congress for Cultural Freedom in the middle of the last century that uh, quite literally wanted to siphon the energies that were developing and that were, you know, uh, for peace with the Soviet Union, that were pro-Soviet. They wanted to siphon them into uh, an alternative compatible left routes and Projects like that have continued. They've they've never really stopped. Um, so that's uh, it's something that uh, we have to fight against uh, because if we don't, we will continue having the sort of repetition that we've had, where you have mass movements, but then nothing comes of it. You know, um, and uh, our our ruling class is is leading humanity as a whole. You know, not just the American people, mm -hmm. and it's leading humanity as a whole to the precipice of nuclear Armageddon.
And it's extremely scary. It's, it's basically a war against humanity that they're waging. And if we can't overcome these obstacles that are preventing the development of these subjective conditions for revolution, there's a lot on the line. There's what uh, John Bellamy Foster has called the two exterminisms, not just nuclear war, but also climate catastrophe. Mm -hmm. um, and the only way to, to provide a solution for either of those, or even the threat, to, the rising threat of fascism and neo-Nazism, the only way to provide a solution is socialism. And uh, to, to achieve that, we need to, at least in the U.S., uh, overcome the purity fetish. In, in your analysis of uh, the United States, you say that you basically make or diagnose three points that whether there is objective conditions for re revolutionary transformations, and you have shown like data is quite clear that there are with enormous contradictions of wealth on one hand and poverty on the other hand, homelessness on one hand and millions of empty homes on the other hand, and we can just go on. Building on all those data mining, you have shown that objective conditions pretty much exist. And obviously, we know from all the strike waves and so on that the masses do act. So then you come to the, and then also you discuss that the ruling elites have been unable to rule as they have been ruling. And this is particularly evident in the international realm where countries after countries are now end up. Mm -hmm. war over Ukraine has accelerated the process. They are moving in a somewhat multilateral world um, under the leadership or, you know, of, of the PRC. And eventually you say that the problem with the West, specifically um, the U.S. left, is that they fail to provide an alternative radical politics that includes history, that includes the working class itself, which is in opposition to a basket of deplorables and so on. So tell us a little bit about, because that's one of your central thesis that the left has been hegemonized by this, what you call as the PMC, the professional managerial class. And you are calling for, at least as I read it, for a working class based uh, left that can, um, you know, give direction to the actions that our society, that the, that the U.S. is otherwise deeming. Would tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, uh, the PMC character of the left in the U.S. is not necessarily a new analysis. It's been occurring since the 70s. Um, and I, I quote uh, Barbara and John Ehringreach, um, who are the ones that developed the concept of the, the PMC. And um, it's 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 important to note that it's around 77, 78 that they developed the concept because that's a, a you know, that's a, a, a period where you can begin on reflect, uh, uh, you can begin reflecting on what happened in the last few decades with the working class, with the development of this middle class and, uh, you know, the uh, a process of bourgeoisifying, you know, as Marx and Engels would call it, a part of a relatively large chunk of, of the working class in the U.S., and those spaces would dominate uh, the largest portions of the left, with the exception, I, I, I would say, at least of uh, of the Communist Party in, in that era. It was it was still um, a it still had a proletarian character. Um, but this is fundamentally a problem because you have you've had the death of the middle class, um, and you've had this this process that uh, my colleague at the Institute Noah Crashford calls uh, reproletarianization, this bourgeoisified uh, section of the working class got re-proletarianized. Uh, and this has been the result, of course, of neoliberal uh, financialization of the last 50 years. Uh, but the consciousness is still uh, maintained within the realm of the PMC and, and, and the previous era. Uh, and, and that's a problem because uh, it's fundamentally alienating for working class people. Um, I, uh, I, I, I cite uh, often when, when I speak about this, the example of, of, of Noah, who's a working class carpenter, a member of the Communist Party, and he's been able to convince all of his workers, uh, all of his co-workers uh, about communism and about the need for a communist revolutionary vanguard party. But then he's asked, you know, why don't you bring them to the club meetings? And his honest response is that it's the, the atmosphere is very much PMC, right? It feels like an HR meeting or a diversity, equity and inclusion meeting. And it's got the feeling of, you know, the way that managers engage with workers. And it's a form of relating oneself that uh, 
is is very um, absent in the way that working class people in the U.S. interact with one another, and that it presents a fundamental problem for 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 building a working class movement. Um, but in a way, this this last chapter is uh, in in some ways really the one that should go first in order because those three issues are the three that I mentioned that I started seeing uh, as I um, started, to, you know, developing in the left and um, and developing the Midwestern Marx Institute with Eddie and with others who have, um, you know, helped me, helped us collectively think through some of the issues of what's going on. We have everything here um, to to build a revolutionary movement, movement, but it just doesn't get built. What's what's uh, what's the fetter that's preventing the, the development of the subjective conditions? And I, as you mentioned, I see uh, three. The first one is this topic that we've talked about, the, about anti-imperialism. You know, if a working class has been told its whole life that communism means poverty, gulags, genocide, et cetera, and that communism has always failed, and then the left approaches it and says, yeah, 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 that's all true, but we, the virtuous West, we're different. We're going right. to get it right. You know, you know how, how incredibly stupid the working class people have to be to say, okay, okay, I trust you. You're going to get it right. It's always failed, but you're going to get it right. You know, so it, it, it's the purity fetish prevents a, an accurate understanding of the world. It, it prevents you from obtaining truth, but also from building a revolutionary movement. And that's one form of it, right? If we can show working people in the U.S., here are the successes of, of the Soviet Union, of China, of Cuba, even while under the boot of imperialist hybrid warfare, that's an extremely powerful argument for, for socialism, especially today with China. <laughs> just just go to China and you can see um, what a, a, a country that uh, uh, is led by a communist party can do um, with its resources, how it can raise the living standards of 800 million people, at the very least, lift them out of extreme poverty, while our, our country is down. Since late 1970s. Because right. A lot were pulled out even prior to that during the Mao era. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. In it, what's often forgotten, uh, people love to juxtapose, you know, the reform and opening up to the previous period. But in that, uh, in that uh, era of the founding of the PRC to reform and opening up, the rise in living standards that occurred was more than had ever been seen in human history. So it was incredibly successful. And in many ways, although there were definitely flaws, um, in many ways, what's done after 78 is building upon uh, what was done before the, you know, in the sort of Kantian formulation, it, Pre seventy eight was the conditions for the possibility of post of, uh, 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 post seventy eight, but if if you can show working class people in the U S. this success, as they look around and they see their country crumbling, um, <laughs> that's an incredibly powerful argument for socialism. So that was one. The second one was that a big chunk of the left, and unfortunately here is not just the social democrats; it's it's also some communists uh, see a good portion of the working class, specifically that part of the working class that um, that voted for Trump, they see them as, uh, in the words of comrade Hillary Clinton, as a basket of deplorables. And that's absurd uh, because it means that you can't organize them. They're the uh, the agents of the fascist threat um, and they they become untouchables, right? They're, uh, they're too impure to be organized. Mm -hmm. And what does that leave communists doing uh, besides being, you know, just the people that preach to the choir? Uh, because if 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 they don't have the right social consciousness and we don't go to them, the more supposedly backward sections of the working class and lift their social consciousness and take, you know, as Gramsci would say, the, the kernels in their common sense uh, that are progressives and, and progressive and rearticulate those to socialism. If we don't do that, uh, one, they're only going to go with the fascists who are, you know, always a, a threat uh, when objective revolutionary conditions uh, arise. Uh, but two, we end up just being the people that preach to the choir. <laughs> you know, we have to talk to people who don't agree with us. If we don't talk to people that don't agree with us or if we shun them out and say that they're un unorganizable, we're only going to talk to the same five people in our in our in our circles. And that's not how you build a mass uh, movement for socialism. So you have to be able to engage with all parts of the working class. And that's something that, you know, various organizations in the U.S. left um, completely dropped the ball on, and it's a, it's rooted in the purity fetish. They're too impure. They don't check off all of the list of my enlightened social consciousness. Uh, therefore, uh, we're going to reject organizing them. That was the second one. And the third one, um, 
is a, a phenomenon that Georgi Dimitrov had already labeled in 1935 as national nihilism, uh, the rejection of the national past of a country because it's too impure. And uh, for this part of the left, and here you have anything from uh, anarchists to the ultra left to various communist spaces, America's reduced to settler colonialism, to genocide, to slavery, exploitation, imperialism, and all the bad stuff that capital and the state have done. Um, and that at times a portion of the white working class has you know, participated in uh, through you know, what I think is false consciousness. Um, but they reduce America, a social totality that should be seen in movement, that should be seen as containing objective contradictions and uh, various leaps in terms of uh, uh, semi-qualitative leaps in terms of eras that it has gone to, gone through and developed and internal revolutions it's had. Instead of seeing America like that, which would be a dialectical way of seeing it, uh, they see it as a static entity. They take the, the bad parts, they treat the bad parts synecdocally as the whole thing. Um, and uh, they they end up in this very weird and one-sided understanding of the, the national past of our country, uh, which ends up then seeing the few progressive movements that they accept as being anti-America or as being outside of America, instead of being, you know, imminent developments of uh, the fact that where there's oppression and exploitation, you'll have struggle. Um, and you have to see it as a social totality in the underbelly of that ugly history. You have a very rich uh, progressive histories of struggles in the in the underbelly of, uh, you know, the most... Uh, criminal presidents and, and generals, you have the history of Frederick Douglass and W.B. Du Bois and Henry Winston and Martin Luther King. Um, and they are as much Americans as the, the, you know, the slave owners. You can even say that they're more Americans because um, they, uh, they sought the practices that they were engaging in as being genuinely in line with the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. And uh, the late uh, historian Stoughton Lynn that just recently passed a few months ago, uh, he has this wonderful quote where uh, he explains how it was that the history of the left has been one where they see the ideals of the right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, a government of, by, and for the people, and national self-determination as ideals that are only concretizable, uh, that they can only be concretized, that are only realizable under socialism, that the logical and practical conclusion of the Declaration of Independence is socialism. And that has incredible potency when it comes to organizing the American people. Socialism, you know, it's not this abstract thing. It has to develop in various contexts. It's it's a concrete universal. Um, and that means that it always has to take up the characteristics of the places in which it is being developed in. In China, socialism with Chinese characteristics. In Cuba, it means taking up Jose Mati and the anti-colonial tradition. In Venezuela's Bolivarian socialism, you can go down, you know, Pan-African socialism. It has to take up the tradition of its people. And uh, a good chunk of the West, of, of the American Marxists today, they don't do that. They can't do that uh, because they reject wholly uh, their national past. And they make this very weird, like left-wing McCarthyite move of saying that socialism means abolish America. <laughs> you spent the whole 20th century uh, the communist movement spent the whole 20th century fighting against this narrative that in this century is being accepted by a good number of the communists. That only alienates you from your people. You know, when you're talking to American workers and you say, what we're fighting for is abolishing everything you've grown up around and all the traditions that you cherish, the good ones and the bad ones, uh, they're not going to go with you. Uh, they're they're going to laugh you off. They're going to close the door in your face. Um, it's much different. Um, to have that approach that's grounded in national nihilism and that really depicts a, a, for a liberal form of American exceptionalism because if everyone else has had to do it, but no, we're the ones that can fully condemn our past, um, that means that we are the exception. <laughs> we're the American exception to uh, the history of socialist struggles. So um, it's incredibly important to, to be grounded and our people's traditions to understand the uh, American people, the American working class, and to get from that understanding of their common sense and sensibilities, aesthetic sensibilities and, um, and, and emotions, to be able to get the kernels that we can then take and, and disarticulate from the incoherent worldview that they're in and rearticulate to socialism. Um, that's the, the basic Gramscian project of the war of hegemony, of, 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 of uh, developing working class hegemony. Um, so it the war of position, I mean. So it, it's 
you can't do that if you reject your national past, if you reject talking to a big chunk of the working class, and if you, uh, you reject a socialist project. So I see that all grounded in the purity fetish. All of the rejections are grounded on the fact that that which is being analyzed and that which judgment is being passed on does not meet the pure standards that exist in the ideas of, of, of these people. The purity fetish is something that, 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 you know, privilege does to you. I mean, you become distant from the real world. Um, you know, you remain inside a bubble for which, by the way, you allow all sort of, you know, diversities and contradictions and so on. This is one of the salient features of imperialism. Like, Every time you discuss an imperial core or, you know, their response, oh, it's a complicated history. But if you have to discuss Cuba or China or Vietnam, it's no more complicated. You know, it's it's just about the Great Leap Forward. It's just about the gulags and these sort of sweeping categories of authoritarianisms, totalitarianisms, and so on and so forth. So that that's something which I guess relate so well to the centrality you have given, even though you haven't um, innovated the PMC, but you have recognized the centrality of the, the PMCization of the left, you know, the left organizers moving away and away from real working class and how that has become a sort of strategically fatalistic, but also historically inaccurate. Like yeah. the, the, the reality is not in black and white. Um, all right, so um, I guess we have about 15 more minutes and as a sort of way to continue our discussion, I have, I have two sort of uh, friendly critique of the book, so as you can take them forward and open up the discussion, and I have one sort of devil's advocate, which I don't necessarily agree, but maybe people would relate to that, so let's start with that devil's advocate and we end up round up with my two sort of personal criticism of that book uh, of your book um so the so the devil's advocate is that towards the end of your book or maybe you demonstrate this very well that we need theoretical education because throughout the book you're searching for what to do with these contradictions how do we overcome them and you are concerned here with the with the US, particularly US politics. And you advocate towards the end that we need a theoretical education, we need theoretical apparatus and so on and so forth. And that should be, I assume, is steeped in Marxism. Um, your critique would say that Marxism has become too theoretical. I mean, categories, I mean, the, the very central category of dialectic uh, one would say that today that becomes um, impenetrable to most working people. Um, so what would be your response to that? Right. So um, I don't know if I would say too theoretical in the sense of like the like a good way of doing theory. Um, it's it's become just another um, intellectual commodity. Uh, and you see this in the culture of publish, publish, publish. What do you do when you publish? You have to develop new concepts. You have to, you know, cite a million people. And um, that sort of culture that uh, that is fundamental to bourgeois knowledge production and to, to what Rockhill calls the political economy of knowledge has allowed a space for, for Marxism. And a lot of what has came out of Marxist scholarship in the West has been embedded in that. Uh, so it's the sort of thing where... Um, you're reading through ideas that are not necessarily that difficult to understand, uh, but that are written in, in such obscure ways that only 15 people, the 15 people subscribe to the journal and willing to read your article are the ones that are going to read it. Mm -hmm. And that sucks the living soul out of Marxism, which I see it uh, in a way as embedded very much in the Socratic tradition of philosophy as necessarily public, dialogical, and engaging with the mass of, of people, you know, uh, <laughs> Philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. If Marx was alive now, he'd say that they've only interpreted in journals that, that 15 people are reading, um, 15 professionals specializing in the same niche field. So I do think that there's a way of, there's there's the need for theoretical clarity. 
because we've had great movements arise in the last 20 years. The war, the movement against the war in Iraq, Occupy Wall Street, the Bernie Sanders movement uh, and the correlate movements of that. Uh, the George Floyd protest, which got anywhere from 25 to 35 million people in the streets, the highest you know, uh, number of people that uh, have engaged in mass protests in U.S. history. Um, you've had these movements, but nothing has really came out of it. Uh, out of each one, literally nothing came out of it. Um, so you, you have to ask, well, what, what gives? Why, why is this uh, the case? And I think that they have all lacked ideological clarity and an organization that can shift that energy into a revolutionary direction. And to do that, you need theory. You need to have a systematic understanding of the issues that people face on an everyday level um, and a, a, a way of thinking about how to move forward. Um, and that doesn't mean uh, engaging with these extremely obscure texts or you know, forcing working class people to like read Hegel or Ilyenkov or something. Um, it's the sort of education that you would give to like a, a cadre uh, a member and to a regular working people is, I would imagine, different. Uh, but um, we do need uh, theory. And I do think that the basic tenets of Marxism, and which is at its core, the class struggle, is very easily understood by working class uh, people. I teach in the in in in, in Carbondale, which is I, last time I checked, the poorest place in Illinois. And uh, all of my students, diverse backgrounds, black, white, Hispanic, uh, you know, very diverse backgrounds. And they all come from poverty in the working class. And every time I teach Marx, Engels, Lenin, Mao, Che, they just get it. They just get it. They're, the common phrase is, this just puts words in what I've somewhat known or have been feeling for a very, very long time. So that's what I think successful theory does. And although I do a call for that in this book, um, where I really develop the dialectical materialist worldview as the way we should adjust our thinking to approaching reality, um, is in the other book that I had published uh, previously, um, the anthology, where I, I, I write a long introduction providing a comprehensive uh, uh, understanding of what dialectical materialism is. And then I, I bring together 15 um, authors from the classical Marxist uh, tradition, all of their writings that are um, centered on analyzing what dialectical materialism is and why it's a more successful way of viewing the world, both in the field of the sciences, hard sciences and social sciences, uh, but also in terms of analyzing geopolitics and, and analyzing the struggles and basically everything. You know, the place that Marxism has developed the most, uh, in my view, at least, has been in China. Um, incredible developments have, have been coming out of uh, the Chinese Marxists. And their big thing is seeing it as a worldview that you can apply to literally everything. Um, and that everywhere you take the dialectical materialist analysis, you will be able to better understand things in that field. Um, so I don't think that... Uh, I do. I, I don't think that the two things are mutually exclusive. We need to move away from the way that Marxist theory has been done up to now, which means removing the purity fetish, and uh, you know, adjusting a dialectical materialist view that gets to the masses. And you know, we try to do that at the institute from anything from two-minute TikToks to interviews and streams, and now we're going to start doing classroom uh, setting sort of university stuff that we have uh, planned down the line. So, um, yeah. One of the things that struck me when you were saying is like, I was trained as an engineer and right from my engineering days when I was studying, we would go to construction sites to, you know, make estimates or study different aspects of engineering. And in one of those conversations, in fact, that turned out to be many later on, I would often talk to the workers there and they, they would say this is in Calcutta in India and they would tell me that look, we are building this building, but who do you call is the builder of this building? It's mm -hmm. either the government or the contractor or these big sort of multinational corporations or engineers like you. And I hadn't read Marx's Capital Volume 1, Labor Theory of Value back then. 
Uh, but it just sort of in an instinctive way it touched me and I felt that this is right. Like this is all the labor is then congealed, what Marx would say, as uh, as something uh, which is a form of value. And later on when I was reading Marx, I felt that the labor theory of value is sort of it comes out of the working class instincts that is based on on a reality. So in that sense, I guess theory and practice has a very deep connection and they are rooted. So that is something I guess we lose out with the sort of PMCization of our political base. And then there is a small question of disorganizing theory even within the university itself. Uh, that, that's perhaps a smaller question, but you know that's also something where philosophy and you know that has become so jargonized at times or maybe training has been so de-democratize that people just can't understand them well it's done for the sake of putting people on tenure track Obviously. not for the sake of you know uh helping people understand the world better um or helping people you know build a revolutionary movement it's it's done to get people on tenure track to let them know what journals have the best impact factors how can you adjust your writing to to fit in there and you know uh i've, I've mentioned them a few times already gabriel rocco he was in that intellectual milieu in France, he studied with Derrida and all the leading French uh, thinkers, and he was publishing in the best journals and books and all that stuff. And the the you know the war in Iraq came, and he's like, "Well, I've I've read so much of the shit, but I don't understand with this worldview what the fuck is going on. You know, I can't understand anything." And then he picked up Lenin's imperialism, and he's like, "Oh, now that I understand." <laughs> so it's a it's a bunch of mumbo jumbo, and it's its own. And that's not to say that there isn't quality work that's done in, right. in parts of academia, right? Um, but it's uh it, it's it's its own thing that's separated from the pursuit of truth and the pursuit of changing the world. And that's why, you know, at its core, I repeat it a few times in the book. The purity fetish not only prevents you from acquiring truth, which is tied, in my view, to a proper dialectical materialist analysis of the world, but it also it makes you revolutionary futile. Um, so it's a problem both of theory, understanding the world, and of practice, changing it. Right. One of the important things that you just said is, and I, I just want to stress it, is that it, that doesn't mean that there is no good content in right, right, right. the theory. Because that's the other side of what bothers me. Like people have stopped reading like, and just condemn. Like, and this is something that has to do with the larger world of social media. Like, oh, yeah. just And that relates to the purity fetish. Like um, so-and-so has done this wrong. So I'm just shunning him or her. Like I'm not reading anything that person has to say. Um, so that that is sort of part of that problem. We also had Gabriel uh, Rockhill, and if you're uh, watching this video, do check out that uh, interview as well. But uh, okay, to uh, now come to not the devil's advocate, but my own to criticism. Um, so in your analysis of uh the of, of, of the anti-imperialistic uh or anti-anti-imperialistic of western marxism you completely succeeded and i i do feel the same and there i guess you succeeded what i would have liked to see more in the book is a dialectical or a more uh sensible let's say not use a you know jargonized phrase is a more sensible way to approach, and maybe that's not your goal, but I'm just saying that why this book sounds like the audience is Western in your own mind. You're addressing to a Western society and not necessarily someone from China, because the question comes to mind is that how do we approach our world in a more critical manner? So, you know, someone in Cuba, reading this book would relate to everything you said about imperialism, about sanctions and, you know, about running terror campaigns and so on and so forth. But in your book, there isn't much about how they can critically look at their own society. So while you you do a tremendous task, for instance, in China to, to uh, defend the opening up during 1978, saying that if you don't do that, it's a capital scarce region. You are damned anyway if you don't do that because you fail to develop uh, productive forces because you lack capital. And then you can so you can say, look, the Soviet Union is so underdeveloped that people have to 
stand in lines for a, for an automobile that you can buy here. So that is on one side. On the other hand, if you open up capital and bring foreign direct investment, you'd be condemned by saying that, oh, you are capitalist. So you, you, were, you were very successful in that, but you failed to address, for instance, um, the loss of jobs that ca came with the destruction of the state-owned enterprises in the 1990s, like roughly 50 million jobs. And this is Joel Anderson's book I'm drawing on. And even today, you talk to my friends from China, you speak about the cultural revolution and so on and so forth. So you leave that critical framework open. I'm not saying you are foreclosing that, but you never discuss anything of that sort. So I, I was just thinking what your response to this critique there perhaps i'm coming from a global south perspective right. uh, to just clarify my own critique of that book i appreciate the critique and it's one that um uh, comrade uh, greg goddles who's from the 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 marxist uh, marxism leninism today uh, uh online journal um he asked me in, in the first interview I, I did on the book um specifically related to uh how it uh, how in that period Chinese foreign policy was <laughs> was uh, far from from perfect, and uh, the the projects that were supported, and in in part, one of the things that uh, that Carlos Martinez was a, a, another a friend and I think tremendous scholar on China. One of the things that he shows is that in in part, the breathing room that China had uh, that allowed it to develop uh, as peacefully was not unrelated to the fact that uh, it didn't have to, as the Soviet Union did spend so much resources protecting imperialized nations from imperialist attacks. Um, and that's definitely true. Um, and, you know, part of, there's there's going to be a lot of things that are left out in part because this is a book that is very much focused on thinking what is wrong with the left in the West, but okay. specifically in the US. Um, why have we continued to fail even as objective revolutionary conditions couldn't be any riper? Um, so, so that's the that's the the aim. That's the question I'm really trying to tackle. Um, and in the process of tackling, that's the third part of your book, right? That's, that's where the, you eventually end, right? Because I, I I have to I I I felt like the the condition for me being able to do that successfully would be me grounding what Absolutely. I'm looking at as an ideological flaw yeah. in the history of Western philosophy and then in the history of Western Marxism, where I, you know, I touch on Adorno, Horkheimer, Marcuse, Shishek, um, who are not in, in the U.S. Um, so I, I I think that those questions are are good and that the purity fetish, and this was a comment that was, we we did a book launch yesterday and uh, my, uh, my, my, the, person who we co-founded the Midwestern Marx Institute with, he made a wonderful comment, which is that uh, as opposed to thinking that the purity fetish prevents one from being able to criticize socialist states, the contrary is true. Absolutely. Without the purity fetish, right. it's when you can criticize uh, without condemning and without uh, fully excluding um, support for, for these struggles. Um, and, and at its core, the purity fetish uh, critique is a call for a, a the return of a dialectical materialist analysis to to Marxism, and that means that we have to see contradictions. Um, and there's going to be contradictions in socialism. There's contradictions everywhere. That's what propels change, and change is incessant. So there's a lot of contradictions that socialist countries have had that we uh, can fairly address, try to address. Um, uh, in the form of comradely critiques. Uh, I think the archetype here would be, you know, the criticism, the critiques that Che levied against certain forms of uh, economic practices in the, so in the former Soviet Union. It was done splendidly well, never condemned the Soviet right. Union. It was very comradely. Um, we can definitely do that. I find, however, that unfortunately, a lot of people that try to do that in the West they do it in a very superficial manner because they don't ground their analysis in the debates that are that are already going on in these countries. No one knows the flaws of China better than their Chinese Marxism. No one debates their flaws and their contradictions and how to move forward better than the Chinese Marxists. 
The same goes with Cuba and with every other socialist experiment, because self-criticism is fundamental in order to develop and protect the revolution, which is, I, I believe, uh, you know, the, the central task that all of them are embarking on, regardless of the different schools that they're coming at it from. So this critique that uh, that can be levied towards socialist states is both necessary in order so that the current contradictions can be sublated, so they can be overcome, but it has to be grounded on an understanding of these debates. And, uh, you know, I'm not against, uh, uh, I'm not at all against uh, that, but in, in my country, at least, and in, 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 although I'm very interested in these debates and I follow the Chinese journals and it, in my country, at, at least in the U.S., the atrocity propaganda on China is just absurd. So the emphasis has to be laid on debunking that uh, that atrocity propaganda that's aimed at hitting our sentiments, right? If there was a Uyghur genocide, uh, man, that that would make you feel horrible. As, as, as communists, you know, part of what we have is a deeply humanistic ethic that feels genuinely bad whenever there's even one life lost in, in the farthest corner of the world. And, you know, if that was really going on, it would, we'd be torn. So they, they play on our sentiments in order to get us to support uh, imperialist attacks and, and atrocity propaganda. And, you know, the in that context, the emphasis of our discourse in the U.S., on China has to be support, has to be debunking myth, emphasizing the positive. And then later amongst comrades, we can talk about you know some of the negatives, uh, but um, the context of the critique is very different, right? So. Now that's a, that's a good answer. And I, I mean, my, just to qualify, I guess I, I would have not even posed this question if I regarded your book just as a book of political strategy. Mm. I mean, then we don't even have to deal with that. We don't have to lecture China, as you said, like China, no, no one understands their contradictions and themselves. But I guess why I asked this question is that your book also has a theoretical value, which right. is of how to approach the world. You know, you, you deal, deal with that very centrally, the, the basic fundamental problem with the worldview itself. And there, you know, there are these, and I'm, so so th there comes that question, like someone reading this in Kerala, in India, for instance, where the communist parties rule, or someone in Cuba and China, that, that, that is something that struck me on one hand. And on the other hand, someone in, very interested in economic history and the contemporary of China, for instance, I often think about a very difficult situation. For instance, think about uh, that the PRC is now one of the leading sovereign creditors in the credit market. Now, obviously, there is a huge amount of propaganda, you know, for about the debt trap, for instance, in Sri Lanka, it is said that as if it's only the Chinese sovereign money that went, while the reality is that just 15% of them. But going forward, as more and more surplus uh, gets accumulated in the sovereign bank, some of them would get go into true credit. And now imagine a country want to default or seek for a moratorium now because the Chinese state would be acting in a credit market the private players be that Chinese business itself or the institutional investors from the west would impose sharp limitations on Chinese state itself to allow the default or or the moratorium itself so these are like real problems that uh that the state faces and so that's that was the sort of ground I was coming from but right. I guess you didn't is China perfect, right? No, and by we we shouldn't use its imperfections to condemn it as the Western Marxists do. Right. We also shouldn't, uh, uh, in order to support it, assume that it's perfect, uh, which means that part of removing the purity fetish is not just being able to support, but being able to participate in this comradely form of, of critique, which I think has to be informed with uh, their their thinking process and and with a dialectical view of the fact that China is a, a, a process, it's in constant development. Um, you know, the Xi era is a continuation of the previous areas, but in many areas, you know, a, a break with certain practices of the past. You know, if you if you read Roland Bohr's uh, book, Socialism and Chinese Characteristics, the wild 90s were 
wild. <laughs> and then the early 2000s, you could go up to any random CPC member and they wouldn't know a lick of Marxism, right? Those are things that have, have changed under the Xi era and they couldn't have changed without that internal critique, right? That self-criticism that's uh, absolutely uh, fundamental. So um, yeah, I, I would uh, I would agree with, uh, with uh, I don't know if, if, if that would count as a criticism if I agree with you, but... <laughs> Yeah, that's why I said like a friendly critique. And this, uh, if if your time permits, like I would just like you to ask the last question, which is yeah, a yeah, even milder critique. And this is something maybe like if I was a reader or reviewer of your book before publishing, like I had su suggested that it, it's not a sort of major framework critique, but I felt like towards the end that you're dealing with the, like who these Western Marxists are when you are talking about them, right? So when one reads the book, one finds very concrete examples, the Frankfurt School, Adorno, Horkheimer, and you have given Marcuse his due place, like that he was very different in a sense from Adorno and Horkheimer, who were just blanket criticism of the Soviet Union, but never, and that was a very good analysis. So Zizek, um, Adorno, Horkheimer, you name name them and it's a very concrete analysis. But then there are also these moments where there are, one is the, the, the reader is left uh, somewhat guessing, like when you discuss on the same breath, the basket of deplorables. We are talking about Hillary Clinton, not Western Marxism. You are also dropping like the problems with the ultra left. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what you use, like some ultra left who, who would say that oh western or u.s history you there is no class struggle or nothing like that this is some something which uh in the european context would be how the british marxists would prior to ep thompson would treat british history that this is just bourgeois democracy and it is the france you know where there is uh, class struggles and socialist traditions and so on and so forth for which thompson had to write that magnum opus um so you are both concrete in these cases, but at times one is left to think whether Carlos is talking about university intellectuals like the Frankfurt School or the Cuba or, or sorry, American Communist Party or the grassroots worker or the liberals like the mainstream Democrats and so on and so forth. So this is just the sort of my observation and I would like your response to that. That's a good point. And um, I would have, in, in part, this, this book, uh, it was asked uh, from the other folks at the Institute for 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 it to be done and for it to be a uh, short, a very readable book. I think it's like 104 pages. And I was able to, to complete it within a matter, of, I think, of around two months. Um, so I've... Uh, I've if I've if it would have had if it, if its purpose would have been to be something larger, that section I think would have uh, had a lot more um, concrete examples of what are the specific agents that I'm talking about. But I I do reference as I'm making the moves of the three central uh, ways that the purity fetish manifests itself. I reference tendencies in the U.S. because again I I see the central audience really as as the U.S. and although I've, I've talked with certain British comrades and they've affirmed that the, the flaws have manifested themselves over there, um, when I make those moves, part of the assumption is the people reading, um, because they're in this uh, in this struggle, they're in the American left, and they they when, once you've been in it for at least a few months, you understand the different tendencies. Um, they know who it is that I'm referring to. Uh, so specifically, like, you know, just to, to drop some names, I the uh, I, I bring up the uh, assessment of a part of the working class as settlers. Um, this is concretely, it comes from uh, this book from Jay Sakai, who God knows who that guy is. You know, there's certain accounts that just say he's a CIA, uh, you know, asset. There's no actual person or, you know, there's other accounts that say he's a He's an anarchist. He's a real person, but it's a pseudonym. I mean, I don't know who the hell he is. But his book, The Settlers, The Myth of the White Proletariat, blew up in the U.S. You know, and it it, it just happened to blow up right when the 
you know, these conditions have been intensified, right? You have people from the Communist Party reading it and sharing it and telling you that if you want to understand the U.S., you need to read this book. Um, you have that uh, occurring in other parties and some members that were PSL, some DSA members and 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 practically most of the other like Maoist organizations because, you know, the analysis is very much in line with, with a certain form of third world Maoism. Um, so for that analysis, that one, uh, that's directly the person that that uh, I had in mind. Connected to that, uh, you have the work of Gerald Horn, um, who, although, you know, I think he's done a lot of good stuff, uh, especially, uh, you know, before the, the overthrow of the Soviet Union, he had a great book on Du Bois, and um, I'm currently doing a work on Du Bois, and I, I draw somewhat uh, heavily on that book. Um, his analysis of, of the U.S. as settler colonialism, I find it to be profoundly undialectical. Um, and it's it's blown up in the left. It's blown up in the left. And, you know, a lot of my very good friends and people that we've collaborated with uh, continue to have this analysis play somewhat of a central role in his uh, in their understanding of current affairs. And um, I do mention him, but I do it in a footnote. Um, uh and, you know, he he's someone who I, I, he's I, I've from what I've seen, he's got the right position on China and, and Russia and a lot of issues, you know, 99 percent of the issues. So um, I didn't want to condemn him fully. And I felt like in part when I engage in this in these critiques, the people that I want as targets are people who I think in in part are condemnable. Not that they can't change and, and you know, <laughs> but um, a lot of the people that I left out, specifically in the analysis of the U.S., I think they can change. And uh, I, I don't want to be condemning them too directly um, when part of what the influence that the book has had has been in some of these figures uh, realizing that some of those mistakes that they were making and uh, reflecting on them and seeing, you know, wh whether they can change on them or not. So, um yeah, there, there's uh, in in one way I, I assume since the main target of the book is American Marxist, even though it has this general character and this general theoretical analysis, um, I assume that those movements are understood by uh, by the American communist reader. But um, ideally, I could have been a little bit more concrete and uh, and who it was that I was um, referring to. There's also you know party politics uh, stuff that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, uh, that gets in the way, but, um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate your, 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 your criticism. It's well taken. This, this is just, this, at one moment, it struck me when you wrote, for instance, that the leftists or the, you said Marxists would, would treat the working class almost as the same way as a Hillary Clinton would treat. Mm -hmm. And I take your sort of broad point that even within the Marxist, and that has to do with the centrality of PMC, there is this tendency, which should be very sharply in contrast to if we look at uh, Italian, you know, reform council formations in 1920s and so on. But within that same context, it's somewhat, I mean, it needs ha hashing, you know, about how a Hillary Clinton looks at the working class and a Western communist, like a communist party member of, of US, despite the problems that you have just convincingly outlined, uh, I guess there are differences. So mm -hmm. that was uh, something that I, all right. So this was uh, an wonder, a, a wonderful conversation. I just wanted to give you the last word on this uh, question that I have. What do you think about these small platforms uh, let's say on YouTube that are coming up uh, globally that perhaps have 10,000 subscribers, uh, people like Radhika Desai, they are doing great work from the International Manifesto Group, Midwestern Marks, we are trying to come up and, and there are a bunch of them. Uh, do you see there is a potential to sort of do some sort of collaborative work going forward? And if that aligns with the vision that you have outlaid in your book, and that would be your concluding statement. Oh, absolutely, man. And it's so it's so important today, right? There's this tendency, and I think, uh, no offense to my, uh, my the old heads. I, I love the old heads. I'm one of my best friends. He's 81 years old. I talked to him for hours on end. But there's this tendency in some of the old heads to undermine 
the role of you know either social media or these different online media platforms. And uh, that's very unfortunate uh, because a, a, a good number of the hours that people uh, uh, live are, are spent on the internet today. And that's just, you look at statistics, seven to eight hours is the average uh, time that an American spends on their phone and on social media. So it has become a site of ideological warfare. It's become an ideological field where like any other, the war of positions has to be waged. Mm -hmm. And it's waged in, you know, in the ways that uh, we've tried to do it in the Institute, it's waged in the ways that you're doing it in the ways that um, that uh, other projects are doing it. Um, uh, you mentioned Radhika Desai, and uh, she's got an awesome show now with Michael Hudson and the Geopolitical Economy Report. Um, so I, I think uh, collaborations are going to be fundamental. We did the the book launch for for uh, the Purity Fetish uh, yesterday, and it was a collaborative effort with the International Manifesto Group and uh, the Critical Theory Workshop of, of Gabriel Rocco and Jennifer Ponce de Leon and, and our, our institute. Um, and more things like that would be really good. Um, we, as far as the International Manifesto Group, our institute is an affiliate of them. And uh, last I heard, they um, they would would like to serve as the sort of center of an international um, way of connecting uh, different groups of our character uh, in 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 becoming affiliated with one another and learning from each other's struggles and in in, in fighting for a common uh, anti-imperialist and, and and socialist cause, um, which is what we all have in common. Even like the small differences that we have, they uh, they they're pale uh, when compared to you know what uh, we have in common. And this is even true uh, of various uh, various Marxist uh, tendencies or tendencies on the left. We have a lot more in common that we have uh, in difference with one another, and we'd be a lot more successful if uh, we can unite. Um, and, you know, of course, there's certain things that break principles and, uh, you know, uh, that make it uh, hard to unite. But um, it's we're going to have to, I, I think, think about uh, in our era how to make networks, how to make these connections that are going to have a, a very online character while obviously needing a non-online character how to make these connections um is, is going to be fundamental in the process of understanding that you know at the ground we have to organize the mass of people um so i i think collaboration is is so fundamental and we from the start we've tried to collaborate with as many as many people as possible and we have the sort of approach to the world where we always like to emphasize what is really really good in various projects and leave the bad part um to comradely critique right um so in our institute we have people from the communist party from the psl frso dsa pc usa all the organizations in the country and um it's been or what we've tried to do is sort of build um i don't know if the archetype an archetype is the right word but a, a model of political practice that is able to go beyond some of these accident, accident, uh, accidental differences and that focuses on the substantial unity that these people have um, across different organizations. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's fundamental. The difficulty with the online uh, topic, and this was a question that we brought up yesterday, was at any moment we can get censored. <laughs> You know, um, if Indian Global Left gets to half a million uh, views, uh, you can expect that well before then you'll probably get censored. <laughs> the same thing with us. That's what happened with us uh, through TikTok. We got to 400,000. We were getting uh, videos consistently every week in the millions of views. And then boom, as soon as the, the proxy war against Russia started, mm -hmm. we questioned the narrative and we got banned. And every time we made a new account, we would build it up to tens of thousands, one of them to a, a couple hundred thousand followers and then banned again and banned and banned and banned. And that's countless hours of work, you know, just down the drain. And the community that was able to be created at a relatively large scale just completely destroyed. And, you know, we we haven't had our account banned now, I think, in, in a month and a half or two months. 
And, uh, you know, every day we post a video and if it goes a little bit viral, um, you have people in the comments, oh my God, where'd you go? Where, where did you guys go? Right. Uh, I'm glad to have found you guys. Again. So it's very difficult. It shows that uh, if we're able to do that with the TikTok, that at a large scale, the vast majority of people are ready for this message. Mm -hmm. But the mediums through which you reach this mass of people, because they're controlled by, you know, the bourgeoisie, they can pull the rug under you at any moment, whether it's Twitter, YouTube, anything, right? Uh, and even if you create an alternative social media thing that's uh, that respects free speech for comrades or something, it'll be found in bourgeois search engines, which will suppress it. So that's a, that's a definitely a quagmire, and it emphasizes the importance of thinking about the ideological struggle in, in these fields dialectically and as, uh, although necessary, not sufficient. Uh, it forces us to to remember that the key is to do stuff in the ground, in our workshops, and in our communities. Carlos, thank you very much for this wonderful time we had. And I think this is the sort of beginning of a future collaboration that we look forward to. Absolutely. We would be happy to. Have a nice day. Thank you, comrade. You Take too. Care.